Great. Thank you, Kara. Welcome. Welcome to, uh, to everyone. Some faces I recognize. Um, excited to have a good evening. So I'm Brandon Small. Uh, for those who don't know me, I graduated in 2005, played uh, from 01 to 05, and uh, have since served in uh, various roles, including mentor and uh, character coach for the last six years. Um, but my main responsibility tonight is to highlight uh, Coach Rob Scarlata and, uh, and Michael Darius. And so I will throw it to uh, Coach Scarlata to introduce himself. Good evening. Hope everybody's doing well. It's good to see everybody. Um, just want to let you know, Brandon is the best. He's an 05 grad. He's been uh, more of a coach to me than I've ever been to him. He serves as our character coach and especially, um, you know, just with everything going on with uh, our shutdown with COVID and uh, all the social unrest this summer has been a great year for me and for our program. And if you can't, if you couldn't tell that background noise is Brandon in the airport. Uh, when we set this up, he had some travel that got set up afterwards for work and uh, really appreciate him taking the time and, and trying to find a quiet space there. So I have coach Alex Cole here as a backup, just in case uh, we lose coach small throughout uh, tonight. But as I look through, you know, I just want to thank our administration that's here tonight, um, supporting us as always. It's great to have uh, Mugi on the call. Great to talk to him in a little bit. Mike Darius, our recent grad that's uh, working his way through, taking a shot at the NFL through the uh, Ravens camp. And um, really looking forward to hearing from him and just giving an update overall on the program. So great to see everybody tonight. Um, just to take everybody through on a quick program update, you know, uh, just like everybody else in March, uh, everything changed for us with our students being home. So you know, we've really tried to look for all the opportunities in this virtual environment. So um, if you know our coaching staff, you know, Coach Doherty and Coach Spencer, older than I am with a little bit more gray hair and uh, have figured out how to do Zoom, which is great. You know, there's a lot of uh, a lot of positives that have come out of this. So from our standpoint, you know, the number one thing we're looking to do is make sure that we can continue to support our players, uh, keep moving ourselves forward with our football program and really do a great job in recruiting. So Really, uh, today is, I just looked online, Brendan, and saw today is National Coaching Staff Day. So, you know, I love our coaching staff. They do a great job with our players. Um, they've done a great job sticking together um, throughout this virtual environment. And uh, it's not easy to teach in this environment and keep all of our players together as far as our strength program and how we're supporting them academically. But, you know, one of the things that, you know, I'm looking through here and I see, I see Bruce Simmons and I see Dan Metheny and I see, Bob Francis, I see Joe Gafkin, I see Mo Banks. You know, a lot of the things that we've talked about with trying to build our program up and create some of this wraparound support that I think is so important, you know, uh, we've been able to do. And, you know, Lee Reed's done a great job of trying to put the support in place for us. And we're, we're starting to get some of the things in place within our coaching staff, you know, within the support system. Um, you know, every week we meet with our players Monday through Thursday. Um, each in each one of those meetings, our support systems come in and talk. So Dave Terry runs our Iron Warriors strength and conditioning department. Taylor Barros is a full-time sports nutritionist that we have that came in from the University of Texas that presented Monday. She's presented almost every week with our guys. Um, Dr. Erica Force is running a mental strength program with our guys, uh, really focusing on self-talk, visualization, uh, and mindfulness, which has been a great three-part series that's really been uh, really supplemented and, and strengthened by the work of our team chaplain, Tony Mazurskowitz, especially on the mindfulness side. Um, he did meditation with our guys this morning. And uh, we've been really working on the mental aspect of the game because obviously we don't have the kids physically with us right now. So all of those things have been great for us. Um, and it's awesome that we have it, especially in this time. So, you know, as far as where we are as a program, you know, we're looking towards uh, a spring season. So the Patriot League is exploring playing a spring season of in-conference games. It's still all in the planning stages. So the target we have, because as football players, you know, it's uh, everybody remembers preseason camp and you know exactly where you're going to be on August 5th at three o'clock in the afternoon. And you know exactly what meeting you were going to be in. So for us, we really wanted to look at some targets and give our guys some anchors and target dates and coaching staff. So for us, if you look at the relationship of, um, March 6th till now, we're probably just about finished with spring practice, getting to our banquet, and, and that's kind of the mindset from a football standpoint. So 
for us, we're looking at a March 6th start. Um, if we do play the whole season out, it'll be a Patriot League season. And with a six-team league, you'll have one bye week, right? So we're looking to play from early March all the way through April. And that's the target that we have right now. You know, the second and, and huge priority for us is recruiting with our staff. So we have a, uh, our coaches have done a really good job adapting to the virtual environment. And I think, you know, it, it's something where we've learned a ton of lessons that we'll use throughout um, the future of the program. You know, we've been able to do some virtual home visits. We've been able to meet with parents. We've been able to meet with high school coaches and do a great job of evaluating, uh, you know, with the class of 2025. So for everybody that just went through their head and said 2025, yeah, that's what it's going to be, right? So um, I know I'm getting older. I stopped quoting the dates that I graduated from school because it makes me feel extremely old. But um, I think for the first time, we'll, we'll have a chance to have almost, if not the whole class, close to the whole class signed in December. And that's just a credit to our coaching staff um, doing a great job of leveraging the virtual environment and making sure that we're doing a good job of evaluating uh, student athletes. And we, we have, we have prospects that'll be in this class again, that very similar to what we have now, you know, we have 93 players from 25 States. Um, we have people committed uh, from across the country. And I really give the coaches a lot of credit for, um, for getting that done and, and working through it. So, you know, the whole part of our job is, you know, talent acquisition, retention and development. And I think that that's really important as we look at it from a coaching staff standpoint, um, from the support staff that we have around our players and for the student athletes that we bring, that we've have here. So, um, you know, I can't believe that he's out of school already, but, you know, Michael Darius is a 2019 grad. Um, probably one of the best stories that I've been involved with. We, we really didn't, uh, you know, Michael wasn't a December signee for us. He made us chase him all the way through February when he was a senior in high school. Right. Um, but if you look at Michael's progression, we talk about four for 40 and to me, it looks great on the seal and it's, it sounds real good, but when, when it comes out and it's a living embodiment of what we're doing, you know, I'm going to embarrass him a little bit before he gets a chance to talk, but you know, Mike's progression from when he was a freshman until he was a senior um, is incredible. And that's because of the Georgetown community as a whole, you know, the football program and the athletic department had a big part of it, a big part of Michael's life, but we talk about it all the time. We really only have access to the student athletes for three, four hours a day. So the rest of the community, our alums, our staff, our professors have really done a great job of helping us with developing our student athletes. And it's a collaborative effort. So, you know, Michael came in um, and was a community scholar, came in, graduated in three and a half years, um, which is a, a, an incredible accomplishment while being a student athlete, um, graduated with a government degree and developed himself. And, and he won't mind me saying this, and he'll probably mention him later, but you know, Coach Rob Spencer, offensive coordinator, is one of the best in the country, hands down. Um, and Michael had a chance to work with Rob one on one. And um, Coach Spence broke him down from a football player standpoint, I think, and really gave him the tools to be one of the most dangerous weapons in all of 1AA last year. I know it because I coached the corners, and, you know, Mo Banks is on the call, so he understands this. You know, Mike made me look dumb, lots of, lots of practices. So, um, going after the head coach's guys is uh, is a good thing. But, you know, really proud of Michael. He'll go through and introduce himself um, here. But just with all of his accomplishments on and off the field, and, you know, I'll relay this to you. Today, our, our guys served as panelists for a kids to college panel on campus, you know, sixth and seventh graders from Johnson Middle School up in Maryland. And I just remember that Michael was one of the guys that was always in the forefront of that for us. Uh, worked and did a lot of that on campus with trying to give it back. So, you know, when um, when they started this Coach's Corner series and they asked me who I wanted to bring on, you know, I, I said Mookie. And a couple of my coaches asked, well, you know, is it just because he's up in the Ravens camp? And I said, no. I said, you know, if I had to sit somebody down with somebody that is the embodiment, you know, of what our program is and what it should be, I would have them talk to Mike. So, uh, Mookie, I'm done embarrassing you. So I'll introduce you and have yourself uh, hey, give you a chance to talk to everybody here. We're going to play a little video of Mike to start with for everybody. And then uh, Mike will introduce himself and talk to you guys for a little bit.
How y'all doing? Uh, appreciate appreciate y'all having me. Um, like Coach Gar and Coach Small uh, introduced me earlier. I'm Michael Darius, uh, class of 2016. Um, I graduated in 2019. Um, I first came in July of 2016 as a community scholar, and uh, appreciate uh, Coach Gar for giving a kid from Hyde Park a chance to compete and also receive a first class education as well. So my time at Georgetown. Um, there's a lot of ups and downs, but I wouldn't change it for the world because they all attributed to the man I am today. So uh, definitely very thankful. So, I'm Michael, nice to meet you guys. So I am, uh, I'm gonna hold the phone up to my ear to try to block out some of this background noise. You know, my highlight video, uh, it would have been shown, but we couldn't find a VHS player. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, no, I, I got a ton of respect for, for Michael and for coach. And so now we're going to, we're going to go to the, the Q and a part of the program. I know there were some questions that were sent in and, um, again, just a reminder, if you have questions for coach or for Mike, feel free to put them in the chat box and, uh, and we will try to get to them, but I'll throw this question out to both to, uh, to coach and Mike, um, you know, Georgetown is a memorable place. Talk about one memorable game that stands out in your mind throughout your time at Georgetown. Coach, whether it's, you know, you as a player back in the 20s or as a coach. <laughs> and, uh, and Mike, same to you. One memorable game. Mookie, I'll let you go first. You always defer to the, the better athletes, so this is an easy answer. You go first. I got you. Um, that's a tough one. There's a lot of great memories. I'll probably go from my last year, uh, my last year uh, when we were at Lehigh, and it didn't result in the in the in the way I wanted. I definitely wanted to win, but definitely uh, the, that last play, the fourth and four, with a minute and some change left, like at Lehigh, uh, down eight, and have an opportunity to to have even to have Coach Spence even trust me in that situation to just throw it up and give me a chance and. Definitely in that moment, down eight, and just the ability to, like, I was sitting in my head like, like oh, we're going to win this game. And I believe wholeheartedly that we're going to win this game. And like, like training all off season, like that year, even like all the, all the seasons past, all the work that I put in, like, like those, those type of moments that I knew I was built for and that I prepared for. So definitely that 72 yard touchdown was, that was definitely a vivid memory that I always remember. Ah, uh, well, of course, none, none of them are going to be when I played, Brandon. So that's that's an easy answer to start this out. You know, I'm looking at some of the, you know, Murph is on the call. Chris Murphy's a Hall of Famer. And, you know, as I look through it, I was going to mention Mookie's uh, touchdown against Lehigh. You know, it was, uh, you know, as uh, to add to that, it's fourth and four. We're down eight, you know, when they're, you know, everybody knows what's ha going to happen. The ball, we have the ball in the minus 24 yard line. Everybody in the place knows where the ball is going. It doesn't matter. It's, it's going, it's going to Mookie. And, uh, you know, I always put my money on number five. So he got a good ball, but he had to go finish it. And, um, you know, that, that is one of the memories that just reminds me of, you know, having a chance to be ready when the play comes towards you and, and be able to go make a play. Um, you know, for me in recent memory, the one that stands out for me is, is gotta be the over is gotta be the win this past year in New York um, against Columbia. I know we play in the Patriot League and that's the goal is go win that championship and play for a national championship. But, you know, there's something for me about playing in New York, whether it's at Fordham or whether it's at Columbia, you know, I'm lucky my dad's on the call. I know my family's on the call tonight. And anytime we can play in front of the family up home, uh, the entire Georgetown family, which, you know, Bruce Simmons, I don't think has a home. He just shows up in every city that we're in, right? Um, but. For me, being able to, to fight through that game, we actually reviewed that game today, and maybe that's why I'm saying it because it's in my memory. But, you know, we played without two starting corners. We played without a starting running back. And um, the kids really stepped up. And the, the game ends on a 7-minute, 24-second drive for 90 yards with Joe Brunel putting it in the box to end it. So, you know, that's the way we want to be able to end games on the football side here. And, um, you know, we're, we're not just looking at the good games from last year. Right now we're analyzing everything. You know, we're going through the ones that were tough losses too, but 
you know, if you have to ask me in recent memory, that that's probably the one just because it was a great team win, had a lot of guys step up. And uh, like I said, it's always, you know, with the Lou Little trophy and the relationship with Columbia, um, those are always great ones to be up in New York and, and, and have those games. That's great. That's great. Um, this question is for Michael. Um, you know, obviously coming out of high school, there were a lot of schools that showed an interest in you. Why Georgetown? Um, my parents, they wanted, they wanted me to, to go to a new city and like, they wanted me to grow as an individual. Like, they wanted me to, to, to go far away from Boston as possible and to make, to allow me to make my own mistakes and to grow and flourish and, they couldn't have been happier when they found out that Georgetown were one of the options. They was just like, they basically would not, they refused for me to pick any other school. And I'm grateful that I got the opportunity to play for Georgetown for three and a half years. And so that was, that was the reason. Thanks for answering that question. I know, um, you know, I know with uh, a lot of the, the recruits and coach that we're talking to now know the facility is a big part of that conversation and a big part of the draw. Can you speak to um, any facility updates, updates to Cooper Phil, how that plays into everything you're doing? Oh, that's Brandon, you, oh. Brandon, you can ask me. You want Mookie? Why don't you just talk about going from the transition from you know oh, going yeah. the going down the bat cave, which I see Ike is on this call. He knows what I'm talking about. Walking in the back, back door of Yates. Cave, to go, Yates. Yes, sir. To go in. You probably have a unique deal. I know most spent a lot of time walking into the back cave in the back alley, but uh, just talking about the transition going from, you know, the opening of the Thompson center, you know, last, uh, this Saturday we had the memorial service for big coach and, you know, um, it was uh, really telling, you know, Father Camp spoke in the courtyard right by the Statue of Mary, which I took a picture of that. That's one of my favorite stories. But Mook, you went through, you know, the transition, being able to go into the Thompson Center. What, what did that mean to you? Like, what was different for you? How did it help you? It was very special to, to be a part of that building because uh, my class is one of the first classes, I believe, to even set foot in it. And it's just like, we got to engrave our legacy and like the hard work that we wanted to push for push forward on for the, like the other, the other years to come. And so it was just really special to be uh, the first, uh, many, the first of the many to, to engrave our legacy into the Tonja Center. And like the fact that like being in like a brand new facility, sitting down in seats that like, you know, like you feel good, you get to sit up straight, you know, see big screens everywhere. Like it, it's a good feeling. Like it's definitely, it definitely lets you know, like all your hard work definitely can pay off in a place I mean, you can flourish and like grow as a football player as well. And during the meeting rooms, it's just very engaging, very interacting and definitely like the facilities um, helped us in our progression, especially turning around even my years for sure. So you, you, you'd say the training room was a little different than the new facility, huh Mike? Oh yeah, absolutely. A lot more spacious, you know, room to interact with way more people it's a different time right now but definitely like in the past like in the like in the old training room like it was really it's really jam-packed crowded you can't really you know can too many people can be in there at once but in the new training room like it feels like there's so much more open space too so it's like it, it provided more of like like the community aspect because it's just like even other sports we got to interact with like we were in there with other sports too as well so like that was cool just to all be in there at once. And it just, it felt like a place that you could just, you, even if you don't get treatment, you could just sit down and just like chill and talk with people, roll out, do whatever you need to do. So definitely the new training room, new facility, John, John Thompson Center. Like, it was great for our development for sure. Yeah, I would say, and I'm, I'm looking at a lot of the guys that are the alums on the call. I see Klesel and Troy and Cabby. You know, if you really looked at it for our players, you know, the training room was in McDonough. Uh, our offices were there, but our academic services were up in the Levy Center and the weight room was in Yates. So when you talk about just maximizing your day and making sure that you, you can get a lot of things done and be efficient so you can be great, you know, not just in the classroom and everything on campus, but on the athletic side of it, um, to me, that was a huge push because, you know, I think hopefully everybody on the call has been in the center, but, you know, building from the ground up with the equipment room and the training center um, 
and the rehab center down there. We also spent a ton of time, you know, in meetings up in the team rooms, but you know, the academic center is there um, with Dr. Habel and Dr. was running from the uh, Cooper athletic leadership program. So for me, being able to have a one-stop shop really made it great for us. And then, you know, our, our players kind of took over our social events, you know, on Friday nights before the games, they ran their own events. You know, I had one job. That's all I had to do was I had to make sure the Chick-fil-A was there. That was it. Right. As long as we had food, the kids were in good shape and um, really were able to use Nolan Hall and the TVs there and the courtyard, especially that I had mentioned earlier, um, which was great. So to me, it's, it's really provided a, uh, a space for us to keep building community and um, really have all the student athletes, not just our team interact together. So, you know, Brandon, I think that the facility part of it is, you know, the number one word associated with Georgetown when you ask the alumni base always is home. You know, and for us on campus, the student athletes, you know, have a home now within the Thompson Center. And I think that that's been huge for us, you know, as we're building our program. You know, to that point, um, we'd be interested to hear you talk about just the culture of Georgetown football, what it means to be a, a football player on campus, what it looks like to sort of build that camaraderie. Um, you know, those of us who have been a part of the program, right, I mean, it holds a special place in our heart. But, you know, these recent teams in the last few years, um, I think, just have a different level of camaraderie, man. So can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So my class, class of 2016, definitely had a lot to do with the culture shift in Georgetown football, for sure. Because coming in as a freshman, uh, it definitely wasn't, like how, how I left it for sure. And so I can speak to um, how it what, how it changed after. So definitely I can recall, and Coach Coke, can, I can attest to Coach Coke for this. Um, it was my sophomore year, the year we went one and 10. And he put his arm around my shoulder and I'm sitting there and distraught on the sideline. And I'm talking, and I just, I don't know what to feel. I don't know what to think. And then he puts his arm around my shoulder. He tells me that, like this program is gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna turn around. And like we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna be on top one day. And like you're gonna be in our class. He he said I I would be in my class would be the driving force to change that. And so going into that off season, that next off season in the winter, we definitely we spoke to our team and then we said we were sick of losing. We we didn't want to lose no more. So we did everything in our power. We worked so hard that those off seasons and I I I couldn't change anything like in, in that aspect, because like we did everything we could do. And it was just great to see, it was great that we could be that culture shift, especially for the younger guys and to let them know, like, like we could be winners too. And like, and we were that because we were, we were dominant in the Patriot League um, my last couple of years. And so definitely I was just a fortunate to be a part of that culture shift and, and hopefully it continues to go in that trajectory as well. That's great. Thank you, Mook. So, you know, you mentioned the off season. Obviously, um, this has been a unique off season with COVID. Um, and so I'll, I'll toss this question to both of you. You know, Coach, I know we talk about the 1%. Um, can you tell everyone, you know, one or two things that you've done during this off season um, to get better, even as the world has kind of slowed down? Um, can you talk a little bit about some of the things that you've done to, to get better, to enhance the program or even yourself personally? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, it's, we always talk about 1090, you know, it's 10% what happens and 90% how you react. And we've even taken it a little bit further is, you know, we're not looking to react to things. We're looking to respond. And, uh, you know, I'll ask Mookie a question at the end of this about his time up at Ravens camp that might, you might be able to help me with this one, but, um, you know, from our standpoint, you know, Tony Mazurskiewicz has come in as our team chaplain. It's another support position that Lee and, and Dan and the administration, Sharon, who's on the call, have added. And Tony um, really started to introduce this, this term and this concept that's been here for a long time. And uh, I'm really starting to research it. It's, it's magis. You know, it, it means more. And that's where the 1% comes from. You know, so we talk about the SEAL and we talk about our three core principles with 4 for 40, SISU, and Men for Others. And you know, to me, the, the mix of those things in action and having Mookie here is, is the actual person that's been through it, you know, looking to get that 1% better every day, you know, and it's, 
you know, life isn't about the grand gesture. You know, you get one championship game a day, a, uh, a year out of 365 for a reason, right? It's not about that. It's all the build that builds up to that. So that's, that's really what we're looking to keep pushing and getting better at it. So we, we had all the coaches and coach Colt knows this, you know, pick three goals for right now that we're going to be with our team and with yourself. So as a staff, we really, you know, looked at communication, you know, coach Doherty for you the go, those who won't know him on the call, you know, he's got some gems and, you know, he says, we're not going to become better mind readers. So we better be better at communicating with each other. So that, that was the meeting today. Honestly, we did a game breakdown in Columbia with the entire staff, not just offense, defense, special teams. It was, Hey, what does everybody think? What do we do with these decisions? And, you know, it's great when you win a game and that's the best one that you asked me about. Right. But next week we're going to do the Fordham game, you know, and everybody that was there knows that was a heartbreaking loss at the end in front of a homecoming crowd. And you better analyze that one too. You know, so the 1% stuff is not just on your great days. So, you know, I think whatever we ask the players to do, uh, we should be doing ourselves. So with the players right now, we've asked them to control what they can control. You know, I can't control that some of our guys are studying from home and that they're training in different facilities and maybe they don't have the same facilities that we do here. The, the only thing we have, the same amount that everybody else does is time, right? So we have the same amount of time between now and March 6th as everybody else does. You know, so for us, we're just trying to maximize that. It's not about comparing yourself to anybody else. It's about becoming the best version here. You know, in the Jesuit tradition and on campus, they talk about it as flourishing, right? You want to just keep create, creating the opportunities for people to become the best versions of themselves. So um, the one thing that'll make everybody laugh and get off the, the heavy, heavy part of the question, Mook, so what, what's Hoya time? Mike, what's Hoya time? Uh, Hoya time is when you arrive. So that point time is when you arrive uh, five minutes or earlier uh, to the start, to the original start time. So if you have to be, if you have a 7 a.m. meeting, Hoya time is 6.55. Anytime after 6.55, you're late. So to be on time is early. No, to be early is on time, on time is late. Yep. So do you remember when I called you when you're up at Ravens camp and you're in the camp? Remember when I called yeah. you on yourself? So yeah. remember what I, remember what, <laughs> what happened? You remember? No, nah, you have to refresh my memory. Yeah, well, I, I do because it was 1130 and I called you because I figured if I got you, you weren't in meetings. So Mookie's like, listen, coach, I'm good, but I got to go soon because we have meetings, a special teams meet coming up. And I was like, oh, what time is it? I'm figuring like 1135, 1145. And Mike's like, no, it's at noon. And I just started laughing because I was like, what are you doing? He's oh, like, I yeah. get in the meetings about a half hour early. So there's no chance yeah. I'm going to miss the start of this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I remember. <laughs> so, Mook, that, that being said, you know, you're obviously exposed at the highest level. You know, you and I talked about this the other day, you know, in your, in your journey, um, you know, just going through being in that environment and being surrounded with, you know, the best in the world there. Um, just maybe one, just one experience from your first couple of days there to tell everybody. And then I'd like to get into how you're reacting to what's going on now, like what your day is like, that whole thing. Yeah. So um, it wasn't, it was a, it wasn't that bad of a transition because uh, uh, I definitely prepared very hard for it. And I had the opportunity to train with um, one of the players, uh, Willie Sneed. He's actually like a current vet on the team there. When I was in Florida, I trained with him for like about a month before training camp started. And um, just to get advice from him, like every single day and training with him and his dad every day. So that that helped me out and gave me a, a big leg up coming into camp. Um, I can probably give, I'll probably give like a, a story. Uh, definitely our first, pra our first practice in pads, um, it was, Things are going like a lot, a lot faster. All the because we had to do acclimation periods with like three different groups. So the rookies, the vets, and then the rest of the the veterans. And so everyone had different acclimation periods. So when the first day of pads was everyone's first day like together, and like practices was like like full speed, full tempo. And so getting the opportunity to go against uh, Marlon Humphrey, uh, all pro corner. Um, it was just like at first, like I was nervous and it was, it, I got, I got to gain one of the rotations. Um, and so it was, um, it was during uh, one of the, one of the team periods. And so um, RG3, he checked, he checked the play and then he checked it. Um, and it was basically just like, 
it was slants, but then like he checked in and everyone run fades. And so he looked my way, he said, I'm throwing you. So get an opportunity to, to make a couple plays on, on one of the best uh, corners in the game right now is, is definitely great. And definitely, I learned a lot from him and like everyone there for sure. That's great. So now just, you know, you and I have caught up a lot this week, you know, what are you doing now as far as training? How much are you training right now? Um, I'm still, so when I first got home, it was hard to really stick to a regiment because like I was going from waking up to 530 because we have lifts in the morning. We had lifts in the morning during camp. We lifted every day. So I lifted every morning at 530 and then we had meetings and practice all day long until, until like seven, eight o'clock PM. And so leaving that atmosphere and then coming back home, it was just like, yeah, I could have, I could have felt sorry for myself. I, I could have gotten more lazy when I got home, but like, I knew that like I had a lot of, I had a lot of buddies that are still training as well. So like we still kept the same regimen. So I still wake up 5 30, 6 AM. Um, I, and I'm right back to two a day. So definitely, just staying in shape, working out every day, uh, running and lifting in the morning, and then uh, catching catching footballs in the afternoon. And just doing that every day and just going at it because I never know when um, God might grant me another opportunity. So I just know that I'm gonna be ready for sure and definitely the most in shape because I have to be. But yeah, that's basically what I'm doing right now. I'm back home in Boston, uh, just working out every day, just spending time with family that I, that I missed. So definitely really grateful for that as well. No, that's awesome. And, you know, one, one of the reasons Mike graduated in three and a half years was to get down to some of these places to train, you know, and uh, I know our coaches, I was thankful with Coach Spence helped a little bit and Mike did a great job with that. And then, you know, the PSA for Michael too is, uh, you know, I've been talking to him this week about our four for 40 stuff. We run a number of nights, Hugh Golden's on the call. Um, and Seth has helped out quite a bit as well with the Gridiron Club with these four for 40 nights. But, you know, Mike's government major, good student. Uh, we're getting them hooked up with a bunch of our guys, alums that are in consulting right now. So we're really working through the process of getting him exposed to our LinkedIn group, to the Hoya Gateway group as well. And, you know, that's uh, that's he's taking care of the football side and we're trying to help him with the other side. So um, really appreciate you sharing that stuff, Mike. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah. And that's great. And, and and not to put you on on the spot, Mike, but what what do you feel like this process, going through this process with the Ravens, has taught you about yourself? Right, one or two things that you feel like you've learned personally through this process. One big lesson that I learned was definitely I'm I'm still blessed and highly favored, no matter what. Um, it wasn't a it wasn't an opportunity that I. I I wish I, I wish I, I had the opportunity to to make the team, but like I know that this was it just wasn't my time, and so I know what I learned was just that I'm one resilient young man, and I know I, I know I just had to get back get back into the laboratory and like continue to perfect my craft and just just making sure I do what I got to do to when the opportunity arises, just attack it like I always do. That's great. That's great. Thank you for sharing. I want to um, I want to sort of take this opportunity to uh, to ask a question that came from the group. So, and forgive me if I mispronounce your name, sir, but from uh, Bill Likamel, Likamel, um, class of '68. <clears throat> question he's asked to. Uh, I guess both of you can answer. But what's been the even as we've talked about, you know, some of the things that you've done to get better during COVID, what's been the hardest thing? Um, you know, one one of the hardest things you've had to deal with, um, be it for yourself, the staff, or the team during COVID. Yeah, I think, you know, the, the hardest thing, and, and you get spoiled, you know, we talked about the Thompson Center and talked about being on campus and being able to see our players all the time. One, one of the hardest things for me is that, you know, we're in the remote environment. Um, you know, when we started this, we really looked at it and said, hey, how do you, how do you keep everybody together? You know, how do you keep everybody close and, and how do you check on folks? And, you know, for me as a head coach with, you know, our coaches and our staff and the players, you look at it and you go, well, you, you can't do all of it all the time. So, you know, at Coach Spence is urging, um, 
you know, we broke down into groups of threes. And if anybody knows Coach Spence, he's, he's a very faithful person. He runs our FCA. Uh, he helps run our Bible study and our, and our chapel. And this is not me quoting the Bible. So please don't take it that way. This is, uh, you know, is a quote from Ecclesiastes from Coach Spence. Um, and it says, though one may be overcome, two may protect themselves, but a group of three is not easily broken. And when he first said it, I kind of read it and was like, ah, I, but what it's really boiled down to is the, is the base building block for our team right now. You know, so as we're looking at it, we have groups of threes. So right now, if it was myself, Mookie and Brandon, I just have to worry about making sure that those two guys are on time for meetings, that they're doing what they're supposed to do academically. And then we're having some fun with it as well. So it turns into some competitions. Um, if you want to see something funny Thursday, tune in. We'll have a virtual rock, paper, scissors tournament going, um, which is going to be fun to see how that goes. Uh, there'll be family feud. We'll do Jeopardy. We do a bunch of different things, but you forget how blessed you are to have everybody around you all the time. You know, the team, the time that we miss the most is probably the time in Leo's in the dining hall, in the, uh, in the uh, meeting room before and after the meetings, you know, those are the things. So the biggest challenge and I really give our, our leadership council a lot of credit of, of keeping the team tight and trying to keep everybody close, even though we're spread out by distance. So you know, that's been one of the biggest challenges. And I think, um, you know, we're still looking for ways to get better at it um, without, you know, being in the Zoom fatigue world, but doing other things um, to keep the kids engaged. And, you know, it's uh, edu entertainment, right? So there's no meeting that doesn't happen without a video or a break to break out in the breakout rooms and just let guys talk to each other, watch the NFL games, watch, you know, watch the young man from Kentucky high, hot dogging as he's going in the end zone and getting the ball knocked out. You know, those things and those discussions are probably what we miss the most. And we're just trying to find ways to, to fill those spaces, you know, as we're working through all the stuff until we can get everybody back on campus with us. Yeah, for me, uh, I'm probably, uh, I can attest to like the struggles with Zoom because, uh, and everyone got signed uh, when I signed with Baltimore and, everyone, and when everyone, um, uh, when everyone was um, all through with like their, their contracts and all that stuff. Um, they sent us iPads to wherever we were. And so not, so not having OTAs, not having, uh, preseason, that definitely, that definitely was tough because like getting an iPad sent to you with just a playbook and them just, so we go, so we had six hour meetings. So four hours, um, just going over installs, probably go over like 80 pages of installs like a day. And it's just. It was, it was very overwhelming, like not having to the opportunity to do it on the field and just like being like taught over a screen. So definitely had to, had to, had to speed up the process and like in understanding. And so that, that was very tough, like getting a whole playbook and not being able to actually like do it and just seeing it on the screen. So I can attest to how hard that is. You know, Brandon, yeah, before we ask the next problem. question, just real quick, the, the one thing, too, I think that's amazing, um, and this is just my observation and Coach Colt's on the call, too, is our freshman class is 28 student athletes that have never been all together in the same room. Some guys were on recruit visits together, and um, they're one of the tightest groups I've been around uh, to the point when we do a meeting like this and I ask who's missing – uh, there's a, you know, there's a freshman, his name is DeAndre Wilborn. He's a, he's a linebacker and he'll tell you who's missing and where they're at. And he's kind of taking ownership of this thing as a freshman. So we've actually, uh, DeAndre's a linebacker from Chicago and Connor Katz is a quarterback from New Jersey that um, just because of what they've done in this, in this short period of time um, are on our leadership council. And that was driven by the coaches and the kids. So I think one of the hardest things is, is being a part, but I think, um, the kids have, they're really resilient and they've adapted and, and really try to figure out more ways to get closer. And that's, that's a big class. That's 13 states in the district represented in that class, 28 kids. So um, that's been really great to see, you know, how they've fought through that and um, really become a really tight group. And they're about a third of our, of our ball club. So, you know, it's been great to see them do that. So that's a good question, Brent. That's great. And, you know, I can attest to, um, just the job that uh, the, co the coaching staff has done keeping this team together, you know, Zoom calls, the breakout rooms, uh, just creative ways to sort of foster that unity. So um, that's great. I want to come back to Cooper Field. 
Um, and I think we have some pictures to show. But um, this question comes from Dennis Hermanstein, this class of uh, business school, 98. Um, and his question is, how will the stadium improvements help the football program? Yeah, Kara, if, if you don't mind, if you want to share the, the couple shots that we have so everybody can see. I know some people have seen some of these pictures, but these are actually from Jason Poppy, who's our facilities manager today. He's done a great job. Dan Trump is on the call and is, is really quarterback this project and has done a tremendous job um, for us with our facilities folks. But obviously that that's a picture from the Thompson Center from up on the roof. Um, Kara, if you can go to the next one, please. Same thing, just a little bit closer there. Um, you know, and that, that picture, we stay on that. If you go back to that one real quick, th this is the thing that I, that is the best thing for me. You know, I'm looking at Greg Kerwick and I'm looking at, you know, George Cullen and some of the guys that actually played there when it was grass, mold banks, you know, we, we played as far away from any human being as possible up on Kehoe Field on turf that they wouldn't let you on anymore. Um, you know, and when I talk to recruits, I kind of put the cursor in the top left-hand side of this picture you're looking at where it's, kind of the outline in black there and say that's where we played because that's you know where they wanted us was was nobody nobody could see it but you know you cannot be on campus without seeing cooper field and if you can take a look with the business school and the new science center and harbin hall you know we, we all know harbin i'm pretty sure maybe bruce maybe i don't know when your your era i don't know but everybody knows those buildings but you know that was a baseball field when i was here those two buildings and it looks like it's been here forever so I really think they've done a great job of laying Cooper Field down and, and making it look like it's been here for a long time. And it really completes that middle piece of campus. So again, going back to the community that the Thompson Center has created, I think the field is going to just double down on that, to be honest with you. In that top right-hand side up by the uh, business school building in between the business school and the science center, you know, that's where we'll be able to tailgate. Um, so our community will be able to be there and watch us pregame. Um, they put a great pavilion in there. There's a brand new cross that's there. Um, and it's, it's really going to be landscaped even more in the future here. So it's, it's really a place to come and gather whether there's a game or there's not. So, you know, when, when you look at it, Brandon, between the Thompson Center and the new field, you know, there's, there's a ton of investment. And, you know, just honestly, it's great for our student athletes to see that, you know, with having 750 student athletes in the student body, um, it's great to be able to have a home, you know, to call Cooper Field and, you know, it's going to provide a brand new locker room for us for the entire year um, and, and all that stuff is being completed as we speak. So we're going to um, really be excited to get our guys in it. So, you know, especially with coming back after um, COVID, being able to come back into a new home is great. So, Kara, if you can go to the next picture, that'd be great. And Dan Trump, I know you're on the call. I don't know if there's anything else that you want to add. Really appreciate all the work that you've done on the on the field for us. No, it's good. That that, that picture from today, the last one we saw, it's it's neat because it's from the last time we met with this group. You can kind of see that the patio is now completed, or the you know that front entrance with the the signage over the top. And then Rob mentioned that uh, that tailgate area. Um, and that just to just to note that cross that he mentioned, it's actually one of the original Healy crosses off of uh, Healy Hall. Um, and it was taken down prior to one of the hurricanes that was supposed to come through. So they actually have kept that that Healy cross and now it's located over on that that lawn. It's uh, it's a pretty cool space. It's a great, uh, great area that we'll be able to have tailgates pregame. And then again, those that are at the tailgate can really just enter right from that location, come along that that uh, north end zone side and uh, the north end zone side, and uh, enter into the stadium. So that, that's going to be a really cool new feature. I think that that our alums, donors, family, friends are going to love. That's great. great. It is. Uh... Go ahead, coach. No, go ahead, Brad. Well, I was just going to say it, it is a beautiful space, and it's a it's a far cry from Keyhole Field. I still have the turf burns from Keyhole Field, and my, my kids to this day ask me where the scars came from. I get to make up a different story every time. Um, but uh, but it's a beautiful space, and um, and the kids in the program are fortunate to have it for sure. Um, so 
with everything that's been said, Coach, um, a couple of questions have come from um, alumni asking, how can they help? How can alumni help the program um, with sort of your priorities? What's the best way to come alongside everything you're doing? Yeah, for, first and foremost, as I'm looking through the call, yeah, it's a ton of familiar faces. So I really appreciate all the support, you know, um, with the program, and especially with our players. You know, we've, we've held six four for 40 nights. Uh, and if you don't know what that means, they're, they're basically phone calls at night with alums and people from different industries. So we've had everything from law and law enforcement to uh, Wall Street to private equity uh, the real estate night, we had our entire team there and we had 30 alums and friends of the program there to speak on different things. Um, and what's been so great about that is not just the nights, but the follow up. You know, we we really are going to leverage Hoya Gateway. And if you don't know about that, we're going to send some stuff out to you. It's a way to network for our kids within our community um, and also really leverage LinkedIn with, with our players. So, you know, I can't say enough about the job that Hugh Golden has done with the Gridiron Club and you know, we're really trying to build on that. So that the first thing is get involved. Now, if you're on the call and I haven't spoken to you and, you know, we, you, you're not involved in some of this alumni and sharing of knowledge, we need to have you involved in that way. And then, you know, after the last call, we did a last call where we went through some of the real priorities of the program, you know, and, and to me, I always say it in the letters, everything else is the people make the place. So, you know, as we build the stadium and as we build the Thompson Center, those are great things. But we are, you know, that's part of us getting caught up to where we want to be in the Patriot League. You know, when you look at who we're competing against in the Ivies and the Patriot League schools, you know, they have those things. And, and now we do. And ours are better than I'd rather play on Cooper Field than play at any Patriot League stadium um, because of where it's located and the situation and everything else. But, you know, for us. I made this comment the last time is, you know, we started playing in 1883, you know, our job right now as stewards of the program is to make sure that we're around till at least 2083 and beyond. So we're really looking to make sure that we're doing a good job of surrounding our kids with great people. I think the department's done that with the initiatives with our full-time nutritionist, the full-time sports psychologist, um, an additional academic person, um, you know, through the summer, and Brandon was instrumental with helping me work through this with our football team. You know, after the murder of George Floyd and all the social unrest, you know, there's a uh, brand new DE&I uh, spot and position that will be critical for the development of our program. Uh, the, the athletic department as a whole and the program, uh, we had a chance to interview a ton of really great candidates. And that that's something that's through all those things I mentioned are coming directly from the support of our alums. And some of them are, you know, department wide nutritionist, full-time sports psychologist, but when you really look at it, um, that's the first layer of support. We need to keep building on that, you know, so for us specifically, you know, I love our coaching staff, but when you compare us to our peers, we're not funded in the same way that they are from the alumni support and making sure that we're doing a good job of keeping great people around our kids. So, you know, for me, it's to work through, you know, some of the fundraising, <laughs> initiatives with our endowments for some of our coaching staff. And it's also helping to make sure that department wide, we're providing the support for our players. And uh, I think we're, I think we're definitely heading in the right direction. Um, honestly, you know, felt extremely supported, especially through COVID um, with what we have in place for our players. And, you know, we need to keep building on that. And the mission is always, you know, talent acquisition, retention and development, whether that's staff, you know, recruiting a nation for players, you know, 93 players from 25 states. You know, a lot of people ask about, you know, our annual fund and what that goes towards is, you know, we're, we're using that to recruit the nation. We're going to use and leverage our brand as one of the best places in the world to go get, you know, we have five players from the Pacific Northwest. You know, we have, we have kids that we're recruiting that are really good players and three stars from Oregon and Iowa and Texas and Georgia and, you know, the Northeast. So, you know, all that stuff takes a support and just, it's a build, you know, again, this is, this is a marathon, not a sprint, but when you look at it, it's, it's having a realistic view of where we are and where we want to be. You know, our job is to fulfill the Magis mission four for 40 CSU men for others, but we're a football program. You know, we are looking to find the right people to help us win the Patriot league and then go compete for a national title. I mean, they just built the world-class facilities and are putting world-class people around our kids 
we just have to continue on that mission. So, you know, we, we worked really hard to distill and define what those priorities and goals are, you know, and, um, you know, Scarlett Schneider has worked really hard with us in development, helping us to follow up on the last call that we had. And, uh, you know, I really appreciate everybody on the call that's taken that call and sat and listened and, and is willing to help us. So, you know, it, it's always about time and treasure, right? So if you can spend your time and help our players and really provide the support that we're looking for and that we need on a daily basis, you know, from a career advice standpoint and just what your, what your journey was, and then the, the real part of it is, is making sure that we make this program sustainable. Um, and that's with our alums and with funding and continuing on, the, on where we're going with this mission. So um, again, Brandon, uh, always a five minute answer to a two minute question. So sorry about that. It's only a two minute question until it warrants a five minute answer. <laughs> then it becomes a five minute question. Um, so I wanna take this opportunity to open it up for, for questions. Those that, that weren't able to send in questions or chat in questions, if, if you have a question that sort of popped up and you wanna come off mute, um, now's a great time to ask it. Coach, it's Bruce. Um, hey Bruce. Let's talk football. Uh, we've, got, we've got 28 freshmen who can't play football in the fall. They can play in the spring. And you've done a terrific job of recruiting for the following class. <clears throat> what are the not so subtle subtleties about some of these kids aren't even playing football this fall. And so they're committing, but they're committing, but they're not signed. What tell us about the, the timeline in terms of getting a, a young man committed and getting them quote unquote signed. And when will we know? Yeah, I see, you know, I, I, I see Mo Banks sympathizes with me because he's shaking his head, right? So, you know, you give your word and a commitment. So let's say I'm recruiting Mo again, which I wish I was. Makes me look like a smart coach. You know, for us, the first signing day is in December. So you can sign and then you're committed in December. So you can't switch. You sign a national letter of intent, which is binding. Um, but up until then, you know, all the kids that we have committed right now, they're all verbals. Right. So we're, we're trying to make sure we do a good job of having the next option there. You know, if you look at this over a 25 year period or 20 year period, you know, you'll have, you know, out of 20 kids, you'll have two to three that go somewhere else. You know, either either they get either somebody it's always the uh, it's kind of a domino effect. Right. A big school comes and takes somebody's kid and then they come down on yours. And so for us, it, it goes back to relationship building. You know, I've try to do a great job with the kids that are committed, really speaking to their parents, to their coaches, to the people that are around them that, you know, just to, to keep the relationship. Cause again, as much as we're trying to foster it with you guys, with our alums and doing these great calls that we have set up and with our players, it's the same thing with the recruits, but you know, I, I'm happy knock on wood that that December signing period, that date will stay the same and lock in. But Bruce, you're right. Like some of the kids like New Jersey just started playing, right? Joe's played Bergen this weekend. You get to watch. There's a lot of kids, including myself, that wouldn't have had any chance to go play anywhere unless I played a senior year somewhere. So there, there's a little, vari you know, there's some variance in there this year where you, you started to see it as, as, um, as schools and, and states started canceling high school football. It started to change a little bit. And I, I got I, – Coach Colt was here as a backup for Coach Small, but – Coach Colt's done a tremendous job as our, our recruiting coordinator. And, you know, I really, his title really for us is player personnel and a GM. And, you know, we worked really hard to make sure that, you know, we're, we're trying to watch as much film as possible, but there, there is, I think in four years from now, you'll look back and say, either you got, you, you might have a star like a Mookie in there that you thought was a good player and really takes off. And then, you know, some of the kids didn't have a senior year so based on their offers they got as juniors, a lot of kids took those, you know, and, and they took it because they got nervous because they, you know, everybody's saying, hey, I don't know how many spots there are. We have seniors that might come back for a fifth year. So really from a math standpoint and trying to figure all that out, it's one of the, it's a very unique year. Uh, and knock on wood, I hope we don't ever have one with the recruiting piece again, because it's hard to figure out. Um, there's, there's lots of variables in there. Yeah. I realize you're not going to name names, but can you give us some idea of where your priorities are and how you're doing in terms of filling those priorities. Yeah, I mean, you know, as, as our program's gotten better and, and I'll embarrass them, but you know, our offensive line, 
in the, in the past was something that we're always concerned about. And can we recruit the right kid there? And can we get, can we get that going? And I know we got some offensive linemen on here, guys have played with me and then future guys. And it wasn't a huge strength for us. And last year we gave up the least amount of sacks in the league and led the league in rushing. You know, that, you can't, that's not a stat that you hear. And, and so when you really look at it, you, and this is coach Colt actually gave me a bill Walsh book about three or four years ago and said, Hey, read this. And really it just talks about building the team through the middle, you know? So if you look at our offensive line and our defensive line and what we're doing there, that's where we're putting a lot of time and energy. Um, if they were all from Maryland, we'd take them all from Maryland. You know, we're, we're lucky enough to be able to leverage the Georgetown name and recruit nationally. So um, nothing against the DBs on the call and the running backs, but we can find great DBs and great running backs in lots of places to find offensive linemen and defensive linemen that fit what we want to do and what's going to help us win this conference. That's always where we start. Always starting with the guys up front. So. Great. Well, um, thanks for responding. Coach Hoya, uh, football family, we have come to the end of uh, our time this evening, but I do want to, give coach and Mookie a chance to give any final comments. So uh, Mookie, why don't you take it first? I'll throw it to you. Any final thoughts? Uh, no, I'm all good. Just appreciate you guys for having me and uh, go Hoyas. I, I appreciate it. Coach. Um, you know, first and foremost, thanks for taking the time tonight to, to sit and listen. Um, you know, there's a lot of friendly faces, a lot of people that, you know, I've known for a long time and, just a quick observation before I say good night, but you know, Brandon Small played for us, was a captain, and about five years ago came and said, Hey, you know, my pastor is a character coach over at Maryland, and is this something you'd be interested in? And um, if you know me, I know I don't know. So I called Pete Lembo and said, Hey, Pete, what do you think? You know, you're running a successful program, you've won everywhere you've been. And he asked me one question. He said, Hey, if, do you trust him? I said, Yeah, with my, yeah, absolutely. And he said, well, you get him, get him involved with your players. And uh, one of the best things that I've done in the last year was, and I'll embarrass him before we sign off, is last Sunday, uh, I was lucky enough to be able to go to Mass for the first time since everything started. But I was invited to go see Brandon as he was named an elder in his church here in D.C., um, which I was honored to be there and be able to witness that and see him. So, you know, just like I'm looking at people like Pat McCardle and, and Bruce and um people that I consider my mentors um, that have helped guide me through this whole thing. I'll go back to what I originally said. I, I've learned more from Brandon, who's a player and I'm a coach. Um, that's why this thing's important. You know, that's why I appreciate you being on the call. That's why our program's important. That's why the mission's important. And, uh, you know, we're, we're starting to figure out what we need and we're going to come and ask you for time or treasure. And with some of you guys, both. Because if we want to be in that league and play with the Ivies and win the Patriot and go play for a championship, that's what we got to do. So, um, you know, I really appreciate all the administration that's on here and the support that we're getting. And, uh, you know, we're going to keep chasing this thing. So really proud of our players. And uh, Brandon can't appreciate you enough. Thank you. Love you. And I uh, appreciate you guys tonight. So thanks so much. Good to see you all. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Thanks, Brandon. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Mookie. Appreciate you guys.